This little device is a multi-channel PCI Express capture card called the X1204XE. It's made by a company in China called Magewell and it's just one of a whole range of video capture devices that they produce. The card requires a four-lane PCI Express slot, which means it can be mounted in either four-lane, eight-lane or 16-lane slots, as long as there's four lanes active. Now I mention this because some motherboards have 16-lane form factor slots in which only one lane is active. Sometimes this depends on what other cards are installed in the system. Sometimes it's purely down to the spec of the motherboard. Sometimes it's a setting in the BIOS. So you do need to check the spec on the motherboard and to see whether there's a BIOS setting that needs changing in order to enable more lanes. The card only has two external sockets. So access to the inputs is through a variety of breakout leads, all of which are included with the card. What makes it interesting is the number of inputs and the variety of different connections that can be supported. The 9-pin socket carries four standard definition composite video inputs, which can either be PAL or NTSC, and they're on BNC sockets coloured yellow. There's also two stereo analog audio inputs on pairs of RCA phono sockets, and these are coloured red and white. Next to that is the high density connector, which carries two multi-purpose inputs, which cover a whole range of resolutions and purposes. To connect to these inputs, first requires a splitter cable, which terminates in two standard DVI sockets. These can either take DVI output direct from a computer, or analog VGA output using this standard VGA to DVI converter. Additional adapter cables are included to convert the inputs into HDMI and analog component. The green input, which is usually the luminance channel in YUV component mode, also doubles as a standard definition composite input. The two HDMI inputs also double as audio devices, meaning that if you're connecting video over HDMI and it's got embedded audio, then that audio will also be accessible within Windows. So in total, that's six video inputs, of which two can be HD video or PC output, and four audio inputs, two analog, two digital, not bad for a card of this size. Software-wise, it comes with direct show drivers for both 32 and 64-bit versions of Windows. This allows it to be used in a variety of applications, including Adobe's Flash Media Live Encoder, Skype, and of course, VidBlaster. So the big question is, how well does it work? And the answer so far seems to be very well. And it even has a trick or two up its sleeve, which I haven't seen implemented in other capture card drivers. So let's look next at how it appears under Windows. Once you've installed the driver, you'll see a single entry for the X1204 in the Hardware Device Manager under Sound, Video and Game Controllers. Elsewhere in the control panel, in the Sound settings, under Recording Devices, you'll see four new entries for the analog and HDMI audio inputs. Other than that, there's no dedicated control panel as you might get with Viewcast or Blackmagic. But there is a direct show capture filter which is accessible in other software. And this gives you access to all the settings for each individual channel. If you open an application like Flash Media Encoder, you can access any of the four audio devices. And the video choices will include the two HDMI and four composite inputs labeled as video one to four, and HD video one and two. Clicking on the settings button will open up the capture filter and here you can configure the selected input channel. You need to be aware that you can only change the settings for one channel at a time when the dialogues open. So if you wanted to change something like the deinterlace setting for all the inputs you are using, you'd have to select each channel in turn, open the dialogue, change the setting, and close it before moving on to the next one. There are different controls under various tabs in the settings dialog, not all of which do anything unless you're in an appropriate mode, and unfortunately none are interactive, certainly when using Flash Media Encoder. And this does slightly limit their usefulness. I mean, for example, something like color correction, you would normally want to see the results of what you're doing 
as you're changing the controls. But here, you change the control, you close the dialog, and then the output changes. However, opening the settings dialog in Skype and you get different behavior. The preview display does update interactively as you adjust the controls. So the issue I was seeing previously in Flash Media Encoder was a limitation of Flash Media Encoder and not an inherent problem in the Magewell driver. The controls that seem to be most useful are grouped under the Advanced Settings tab. At the top is Input Selection, which is only really needed for the multi-purpose HD inputs. And even there, the Auto Select seems to do a pretty good job most of the time. The only time I've had to make a manual selection is when I was using a composite input and connecting it to the green connector of the component, which is the Luma channel of a component signal. And because the input was defaulting to component, I was just seeing a black and white image. Lower down are the output settings. Here you can see the format. In other words, the size of image and the frame rate that's being passed to the host application. In this sense, the Magewell driver is rather like the VidBlaster VVD in that it will output at a different size to the input video depending on what the host application requests. So you can see here that although the video input is 720.576, that's standard definition PAL, because Flash Media Encoder has had its input size set at 640 by 360, the driver is converting the output to 640 by 360. This is really quite a useful function, and I think it might be being performed in hardware. Although I haven't done a definitive test, what I did do was to set up a full HD input, that's 1920 by 1080, into Flash Media Encoder, with it streaming at 640 by 360. Now if I set the input in Flash Media Encoder to full HD so that Flash Media Encoder was doing the downscaling, I was getting more CPU usage than if I set Flash Media Encoder to the size that I wanted, which was 640 by 360, in which case the Magewell driver was doing the scaling down and that seemed to use less CPU. Now, if it is software-based, either they've got a more efficient algorithm or, more likely, it is being scaled in hardware. Now, that has a, a real benefit inside VidBlaster. If you've got a camera that's outputting uh, at 1080 and you want to scale it down either to 720 or standard definition, then having a driver that will use the card's onboard hardware will certainly save CPU resources compared with doing it in software. Underneath the format display, there's also three sets of controls for dealing with scaling, deinterlacing, and image orientation. The scale control has got three options for what to do if there's an aspect ratio mismatch. Fill output image will potentially change the aspect ratio so that the image always fills the screen. This setting would typically be used when you've got standard definition video, which is anamorphic, so it's normally in a 4-3 ratio when it's recorded, but it needs stretching out to fill a widescreen display. The next setting, Keep Aspect Ratio, Fill Border to Black, will keep the original ratio and underscan the image, leaving black borders around the edges. On the other hand, Keep Aspect Ratio Clip Border will overscan the image, making it larger, and crop the edges to maintain the original aspect ratio. Both of these second two options might be used when, say, a 4.3 source needs to be transmitted in a 16.9 frame, or indeed the other way around when a 16.9 image is being transmitted in a 4.3 frame. As an example, let's have a look at how it works when using a 16.9 source image and the output needs to be 4.3. At the moment, the input size is set to 640 by 360, which is a 16-9 ratio, so everything is as it should be. If I change the input size to 640 by 480, that's a 4-3 aspect ratio size. And initially, the image is being stretched so that the circle in the middle is no longer a circle and has turned into an oval, but all the information from the original image is present. 
Now there are two ways of dealing with this. Using the setting which is called Keep Aspect Ratio Fill Border to Black. We now have all the information still retained and the correct aspect ratio, so the circle is a circle, but black borders have been added top and bottom to make up for the difference. The other option in the driver panel is keep aspect ratio clip border. What happens now is that the edges have been cropped, so the two red columns have disappeared, 0 and 11. In fact, part of number 1 and part of number 10 have also gone. The image does retain all the original height, and the circle in the middle is still a circle. So basically, there's two ways of dealing with mismatches if you want to avoid the images being stretched or squashed. And it just depends on whether you want to add black borders or have part of the image cropped. Next down, we have a deinterlacing function, which can be performed here in the driver. The standard vertical blend is pretty much the same as you get in the Camera 2 module in VidBlaster. It's hard to tell whether this one's performed in hardware or software because the CPU usage seems to be almost identical whether it's on or off. The motion adaptive setting does use more CPU, but as yet I haven't really been able to try out enough different types of footage to see what sort of difference it makes and whether it's worth using but it is nice to see options like this included. The final two image controls provide independent vertical flip and horizontal mirror functions, which are useful if you ever need to sling a camera upside down or to shoot through a mirror. Enabling both will effectively rotate the image through 180 degrees, which is exactly what you need to do if you have the camera upside down. It probably won't have escaped your notice that we haven't actually featured VidBlaster so far, and that all the tests have been done using Flash Media Encoder. Well, there is one important reason for that, and that is because in VidBlaster, there isn't a settings button that will open a general purpose direct show dialog. And that's what a lot of cards have got. Now in, in VidBlaster, all you have when you click on a module is the video resolution setting and frame rate, but there's nothing that will open a general purpose dialog box. So that's the reason why up till now I've been doing all the tests and all the demonstration in Flash Media Encoder. So what do you actually get to see when you're working in VidBlaster? If you right click on a module as usual, you'll see video resolutions and in the case of the HD module or at least when you're working with an HD input and you click on the video resolutions there is a huge list now a lot of these are designed for picking up things like VGA resolutions and computer resolutions but as you can see you are pretty well catered for in terms of all the different things that it will cope with I've not had all the possible inputs connected simultaneously, mainly because I haven't got that many sources. Uh, here I've just got one analog composite standard definition and one uh, 720p HD input coming in over HDMI. However, I've got no reason to believe that it wouldn't work, bearing in mind that it's a four lane PCI Express card, so there's plenty of bandwidth on the input side the only thing that would be lacking is possibly the CPU power to handle it all within VidBlaster. But that's a common problem that everyone's experienced, no matter whether they've got a single card or a number of separate input cards. Certainly, dealing with multiple HD inputs, as we all know, is a problem. So, what's my overall conclusion on the Majorel X1204XE? Well, I think it's an excellent card. I like the multiple inputs, the fact that there's two HD inputs that are very versatile and another four standard definition inputs plus the four audio inputs. I also like the versatile driver. 
It's got a good range of settings and functions like the deinterlace, the various scaling options and the mirror flip. The software installation was pretty easy. The card seems to have been completely stable in all the tests. There was one very minor bug that I found and that was just that the flip didn't work on a couple of the inputs, but I'm sure that's an easy fix for them. So what's not to like? Well, a big one really is possibly the price because the cost is 899 US dollars and that's buying it direct from China. So you'd have shipping costs on top of that plus local taxes. And that's another part of the problem is that at the moment there really aren't any international distributors or at least none in our area. And Majorwell seem to be looking more for partnerships where people will take the cards as an OEM product and bundle them with a product. So they're looking for people who are going to buy 10, 20, 100 at a time and are not really geared up for people buying small quantities. In fact, uh, you probably saw right at the beginning when I was scrolling down their web page, they've got a whole range of products. And although certain of them like this one score because they've got a lot of inputs on a single card, when you look at some of the other products, they do, for example, a single HDMI input card or a single SDI input card. Both of those are $249. Now, that's about the same as a Blackmagic uh, Decklink card, but that's in and out. If you compare it with the new mini cards that Blackmagic have brought out, they're only $145. And compare it with the uh, rebranded Yuan 500 series card, which is the StarTech PEX HD cap, that's cheaper still. And it's just as versatile as an HDMI card in that it will do all sorts of uh, computer outputs as well as HD video. But uh, as I say, they do quite a big range of cards. The advantages are principally that if you want a lot of inputs on a single card, then there's not a lot of other choices and they start to look more competitive. It's only against the low budget cards, which are typically single input cards, that they're not so competitive. And the problem there, as we all know, that you only have so many slots in the PC. So it's easy to run out of slots if you need lots of inputs. Now, not only do they do uh, cards, in other words, PCI Express cards that are going to plug inside a desktop machine, they also do some external capture boxes. So if you're not so enamored with the prices on the uh, card that I've just reviewed, perhaps you'd be more interested in this. And this is a USB 3 external capture box. And this particular one has got six composite inputs uh, and also six audio inputs. But the key thing is it's got six video inputs, potentially could plug into a laptop and give more standard definition inputs than you would get through normal USB devices. And the price for this particular one is $459. So that's quite a lot more competitive. Now I have done some tests with this as well, not as many as I've done with the other card. And in general, it seems to work very well. It certainly works with Intel chipsets as you would find on an Ivy Bridge set uh, motherboard something for example with a Z77 chipset. I've also tested it on uh, a VIA chipset USB 3 card, worked fine on that. A late model NEC chipset worked fine, but an early one uh, that I was using my Intensity Shuttle with, which was the Asus U3S6 card, that had a few problems uh, in that the USB 3 device kept connecting and disconnecting pretty much rendering it unusable, but not as unusable as an AS Media chipset. One of the Asus motherboards that I was testing had an Ivy Bridge chipset and also an AS Media uh, USB 3 chipset. And every time I plugged this thing in, into the AS Media port, within about a minute, it would completely crash Windows with a blue screen crash. So that's something to avoid. If you've unfortunately got a 
motherboard or laptop that only has an Asmedia USB 3 chip, then this probably isn't going to work. But otherwise, interesting device, and I'll be doing some more tests on this and hopefully show an example with six inputs running into VidBlaster in another feature.